Welcome to the lecture. Today we're going to hear about mega trends and uh, how they might influence your strategy. But we're also going to have uh, the first look at how Richard Rommel is looking at good strategy and uh, bad strategy. Uh, we'll probably start by going uh, before the strategy and looking at vision, mission and, uh, and values. And then we'll end up in finding out how these things are going to influence uh, your service management company. But first of all, the quotes of the day. Um, it's very important that uh, as a, a leader that you actually are aware whether your people are following you or whether you're walking the paths all on your own in there. So think about that when you get in that uh, situation yourself. And then also find out how you want to use the strategy that you uh, create. We'll come back to that uh, a bit later um, when we talk about Richard Rommel. First of all, do we need to have vision, mission, and values? Should we really bother about that? As you know from the book of uh, Richard Rommel, uh, he has some very clear opinions about this. Um, if things are bad, then you don't really need to have them, and he's really looking at how he can change that into doing something good with the strategy. A lot of the visions that are created are pretty generic uh, and not leading to anything uh, specific. Uh, so when you create a vision, and we'll come back to that, then make sure that it's accurate and actually is not uh, something that could be taken by any company. The same goes for, uh, for missions. They often uh, are very high sounding, very politically correct, but doesn't really communicate what should be done with the company. And if you look at most values from companies, then you'll see that they are non-controversial, they're generic, and could, without the logo, which is connected with them, basically be linked to any company. Let's have a look at that. There's another definition of, uh, of vision, and this comes from one of the other books that, uh, that we have on the course, which is by Roger Gill, uh, where he says that uh, the, the definition of the vision is that this is a statement that represents the true north of the company, and that this is basically the foundation for any kind of effective leadership uh, in the company and not at least the driving force for organizational change. And this is a very important, uh, a very important definition uh, because if you can use this in the right way, if you can find a definition, if you can define your vision in that way, then you have a way to use a vision in a meaningful way. Now, uh, a definition should also be brief, it should be clear, it should be valid, and it should be desirable. Uh, it should be something that people can visualize in their heads because thereby it's easier to find out what it actually is, is all about. And it should be possible to communicate this uh, every day and thereby linking it to the actions and, and the behaviors of the people in the company. Disney has a very good uh, example of that, to make people happy, which clearly communicates all of what Disney is about. The mission, it flows from the vision. And it should give the organization its uh, identity. Uh, it should describe more in depth about the purposes, how the company is distinct from others, and what products and services that the company is, uh, is delivering. And also here, Disney is very clear in their mission. It is to become the leading entertainment company in the world. No less, no more. Now, notice the word, the word leading. Uh, you would notice that uh, Richard Rommel is uh, very um, conscious about uh, using words like leading, best, etc. But I believe that if we define that later on, then this is the right way to do this. Then we have the values. Uh, and this is what the employees should live from. And uh, depending on the company, the size, uh, the way it works and so on, then these can be more or less important. Uh, but if you want to create a set of values for the company, then you have to make sure that they're actually uh, actionable and they are to be lived by. And, and a company like, uh, like Disney, then this is of course very important with the number of people they have working in their entertainment parks, amusement parks and so on. So what they have focused on is things that clearly communicates what they would like to have uh, the employees uh, thinking about. And this is related to the innovation, the quality of community, uh, the storytelling, etc. Uh, of course, it would be different to, from, uh, to another company. 
depending on what this is about. But if you do it in this way, if you have the vision, the mission, and then go to the, to the values in this way, then you are able to create this in a positive and actionable way. So now, go in the net, and then take your favorite company, find their vision, find their mission and their values, and check whether they fit to the definition that you've just been through. Okay, here we are back again. I hope that you've called your uh, favorite company or went on the net and found the, the vision, the mission, and the, the values. Uh, write them down. Uh, we're going to use them uh, later on. Now, strategy and other definitions. There are many different ways of defining strategy. Uh, but uh, what we're going to do here is to take the starting point from what Richard Rommel is defining as a, a strategy. As he says, this is a way to, uh, to go through any kind of difficulties to, uh, uh, to approach uh, and overcome obstacles, and it is a response to a challenge. We'll come back to that later on because he clearly defines uh, the difference between good and bad strategy. Now, strategy cannot live alone, so this is linked to a number of other uh, things that we need to define clearly. One of them is a goal, and the goal is basically the overall value uh, and the desire that the, the organization uh, is, uh, is looking for. So this is a broadly formulated um, definition, a broadly formulated uh, thing, uh, which uh, does not go specifically into anything which is measurable uh, or otherwise. Because here the objective comes in. And the objective is what is linked to a specific operational target. This is where you want to define the specific results that you want to accomplish, uh, and hopefully that this can cascade into the uh, outcome that you want to have. So there's a clear definition and a clear uh, difference between the definition of a goal and an objective, which is very important that you understand and that you use uh, when we talk about strategy. Then we have the deadlines. Because if you don't have any deadlines for whatever you're going to decide uh, in your strategy and the objectives that you're putting up, then not a lot of things are going to uh, happen in there. So make sure that you always have a set of uh, deadlines to support your uh, strategy. And not at least the plan, which of course is linked closely to the, to the deadlines. The deadlines also have, by the way, to be uh, reachable and, uh, and logical. Uh, but the plan is the way you're going to do it. This is where we go down to the nitty-gritty details and make sure that we have the, uh, the right uh, steps uh, within the, uh, the plan so we can achieve the, the objectives, which again leads to the overall goals. Uh, we make sure that we have the right resources uh, behind that. Uh, not at least also the, uh, the budget uh, is very important in this context. When you look at your strategy, there are a few things that could be beneficial for you to look into and have as kind of a checkpoint. Now, I've taken these from uh, Kathy Enns, uh, who has written uh, a book about uh, hospitality. Um, and what she says is that a strategy has to be long-term oriented. So we are not looking at a strategy which is only a, a few weeks, a few months. Uh, it has to look into the future several years in there. Now, how many years is that? Depends on your situation. Could be three years, could be five years. But make sure that this is long enough for you to uh, for you to have the, uh, the binoculars on there and look ahead on things. It also has to be intent-focused. It means that the managerial vision has to be in, in place. We have to know in what direction the company is going. We'll come back to that a bit later when we talk about the way that uh, Richard Rommel wants to use strategy and when we talk about the diagnosis of, uh, of his uh, kernel. And it has to be comprehensive. So it has to uh, cover the company as such, and it has to uh, envision that uh, the company is part of something bigger. You can't make a strategy in a silo. You have to take sure to make sure that you take your competitors and the surroundings, stakeholders into consideration. It also has to be opportunistic. So when you have a strategy, it has to be made in a way so that you are able to react on whatever is happening on the, on the market. Uh, if it is too strict, uh, if it doesn't uh, lie out a uh, sufficient highway towards your uh, objectives uh, and goals, 
then it'll be difficult for you to react on whatever your competitors are doing or whatever uh, the surroundings are handing you out through the uh, strategic period. And then, of course, it has to build on the past and the present. You should learn from your mistakes. You should learn from the way that you have done things before, both the successes and the fiascos. Uh, and you have to make sure that you build things on reality. Um, also, this is what uh, Richard Rommel is very focused on, that a lot of things that are done on strategy is more visual thinking or blue sky than anything else. Build things on reality. And then build it on <coughs> difficult word, hypothesis, so that you come up with different ways of doing that, discuss these things through, Make sure that you have the uh, creative ideas uh, in, uh, in place and that you evaluate that. And be prepared to take risks. If you're not prepared to take risks, you will never be able to uh, really achieve uh, excellent results. Trends are always interesting to discuss because this is where we look into the future. And we all want to look into the future and be part of deciding how that's going to happen, what's going to happen, and also see how the future will influence the way uh, we are working, the way we are living, and the things that we are going to do uh, in the next years, many years. Now, there are four ways to figure out whether a trend has the potential to trigger or shape your strategy. The first one is when you look at your vision, does it influence your company's vision? So whatever vision you have in there, you should have a look at the trends uh, that exist and then find out will that have an influence on our vision. The second one is new business concepts. If you have a, uh, a new business concept, um, does a new vision justify that you have that business concept? Does it justify that you come up with a, brand, uh, with a new brand, etc., a new route to market, whatever you're doing in there? Or is it just something which is maybe not a lasting uh, trend, but something that is there only for a few years? New products, services, and experiences. When these things come up as a part of a, a trend, then you have to find out whether you are able to add something uh, for any kind of specific customer segment that you are servicing today or that you would like to, to service. Is it something that you can use or is it something that does not have an influence on the industry that you are in? And not at least marketing, advertising, and PR. Are you able to speak the language of consumers uh, who are in that trend? And can you show them that you, are, that you also understand that uh, and that you are excited about it? Uh, a lot of people, of course, are start talking about uh, social media and so on. Uh, and everybody wants to be on social media, uh, not at least the, uh, the companies. But only 25% of all the companies that are on social media actually have a strategy for what they want to do with it. So if you don't have a strategy on what you want to do, then don't uh, go into the, the trend, but be aware of what trends are out there. Let's have a look at that. Pretend that you are the CEO of Tesco. Pretend that you're the CEO of Radisson Blue. And imagine then how the following trends would influence you. There are many trends, and not all of them will uh, have an influence on the business you are in. Uh, there are many companies who are uh, living from defining different trends. If you go in and look at them, then you'll find out that there are probably 10, 12, 15 trends that will have an influence on our future uh, over the next uh, 20 to 30 years. So what you should do is uh, find out what trends in general are there and then define or uh, take care of the ones that are actually uh, important for your industry. One of them is what is happening with from west to east. Is this how we lost the, the West? The West has, for the last many, many years, been the, uh, the center of the, of the world. <coughs> but that has changed dramatically uh, during the last uh, just few years, five to ten years. Uh, if we look, for instance, at the uh, emerging markets and if we look at the global growth in the future, then most of that growth, by far, uh, will come from uh, the emerging markets and not from the uh, the Western world in there. So how is that going to influence you? If we look at the, uh, let's say, the more advanced things, we have always, uh, or for many years, been 
used to that we in the West were delivering the intellectual capacity uh, of, uh, of the world. We were building the, uh, the big architectural things. We were developing uh, the uh, new technical things and so on. But as you can see here with the two towers in, uh, in Toronto, uh, they have actually been uh, drawn by a Chinese uh, architect and they opened here in 2011. And also the brands. Most of the brands that, uh, that we know today are, are Western, but that is changing rapidly. And the, uh, the, the Brazilian brand uh, Itao uh, has uh, climbed up the, uh, the list of the biggest banks in the world and has during the last uh, two, three, four years become the ninth biggest bank in the world. And they are now on their way into uh, the, the European uh, markets. So we'll see a lot of new brands uh, going into the, uh, to the markets. Uh, the, the, uh, some of us uh, who are living in the, in the West will see that. We'll also see that what we beforehand expected was uh, low quality uh, products and brands coming from the, uh, from the new markets, the emerging markets, will probably be uh, not only uh, cheaper, but also better than the products that we have on the markets today. We will start buying new uh, Chinese brands, uh, maybe not even knowing that they are, that they are Chinese, uh, because they will be able to push their way into uh, the uh, shops that we have here in, uh, in the Western world. Uh, thereby, we will be able to, uh, from the positive side, also have a much higher um, degree of assortment and, uh, and uh, more interesting brands uh, to choose from. Some of the brands are already here, and some of them we already know. Uh, Lenovo uh, was bought by the Chinese uh, uh, several years ago from, uh, from IBM. Uh, so we probably all, all uh, know that. Uh, Itao, uh, I've already uh, mentioned in there, but also Unibanco is, uh, is a good example of that. Uh, we also have brands like uh, Ruski Standards, uh, which is uh, a purely Russian brand of, uh, of vodka, which has conquered uh, a lot of countries uh, during the last uh, five years. And not at least uh, the Chinese uh, producers of uh, technical products like uh, Huawei, um, who uh, are now uh, sending a lot of mobile phones uh, on the market, uh, good quality at a lower price. So this is what we're going to see in the future. Now, but the rise of the rest doesn't mean that we are going to uh, go down in the West, not necessarily anyway, because we have the established markets here in the West. And we will always, uh, or for many years to come at least, be interesting for the, the people in the, uh, in the East, for the Chinese, the Russians, the Brazilians and so on, uh, because of our heritage, because of uh, the way that we are living, because the rule of law, etc., etc. So uh, there will always be a lot of people coming to, uh, to the West uh, to, uh, to live and, and work here. We just have to find a way to utilize that in the best possible way. The example with Harrods uh, and uh, Lafayette uh, in, in Paris uh, is a good example of that, where they try to uh, get more Chinese shoppers uh, in, the, uh, in their outlets by having special um, help for them. For instance, you can use your, uh, you, it'll be easier for you to use your Chinese uh, uh, credit card uh, in the shops. They have Chinese speaking staff, etc. And also here in, uh, in Copenhagen, uh, we have the, in the airport now uh, instructions in Chinese as, by the way, one of the only airports in, in Europe. I think the other one is uh, Helsinki Airport. The next trend is that people will continue to move from the, uh, the oral, uh, rural uh, areas to, uh, to the cities. Uh, we see that everywhere uh, and that trend will continue for many years to, uh, to come. That also means that we're going to have a new uh, concept called uh, city shumers, uh, which are people who will come in and uh, to a higher degree use the services of the, of the cities. Uh, all trends are saying, uh, all statistics are saying that the cities will grow substantially in the, uh, in the future. And of course that goes not at least for the cities in, uh, in, the, in the emerging uh, markets. Um, so the fastest growing cities will be, all of them will be cities in places that we would normally not look at when we talk about big cities. So what will that have an influence on uh, how we are doing things? 
Well, in, in Amsterdam, already now, uh, they have noticed that they need to have uh, cheaper accommodations uh, for uh, a lot of the, uh, the people coming in, uh, tourists, etc., but also uh, travelers uh, around. So they have uh, come up with the, with the City Hub, which is basically a very small place to, uh, to sleep, but a place where you will uh, have uh, access to, uh, to internet, uh, and more information, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, compared with a normal hotel, and the price is uh, is pretty low. Also, Hyundai, the Korean uh, conglomerate, has created uh, these kitchen gardens, which is kind of a uh, a refrigerator, but made in a way so you can grow your own vegetables in the city. Of course, that is a, a pretty good idea when more and more people are living in the cities, and the cost of transport are going to rise dramatically. We're also going to have Bobs, which are the bottom of the urban pyramid. Uh, the more people moving to the, uh, to the cities, the more, uh, uh, the more, let's say, people with lower income will also be uh, moving to the cities. Uh, and that means that, that uh, you need to have products which are able to, uh, to accommodate uh, these people in there. Uh, the Indians have invented a very uh, pricey or, or low-priced uh, tablet. It costs only $35, uh, and that works, uh, as far as I know, uh, pretty well. And that gives a completely new uh, possibility to, for access to uh, the, the young Indians. Also, uh, in uh, uh, Malaysia, uh, where, the, uh, where they've created cheap uh, or at least inexpensive uh, housing by using containers and putting them uh, together uh, so that they are able to uh, handle uh, more people in the cities. So what I wanted to do now is to uh, think about how two of these trends, uh, or how these trends will influence uh, your strategy. So uh, think about it and write down um, how, if you were the head of Tesco, if you were the head of Radisson Blue, how would these trends influence your strategy? Okay, now almost finished with the, uh, with the trends. Then let's uh, look to strategy and go a step back on this one. What I wanted to do now is to take your phone uh, or call on Skype and then call your favorite company and find out whether the person in the other end who picks up the phone actually can tell you what is the vision of the company. So call the same company that you chose before on the exercise on on vision, mission, uh, and, and values, and call up and find out whether they actually know that. When you've done that and you go into learn, you will find the, the spreadsheet I put in there, and then you mark uh, the company you have called. You've, you will mark whether this uh, company, according to what you found out on the net, actually have um, vision, mission, and values that uh, are according to our definitions, and then whether the person that you talk with knew what the uh, the vision of the company uh, is, or whether they had to look it up, or whether you're going to be transferred to another person. And also, maybe someone is going to be rude to you, so write that down also. After we have looked at uh, this, I'll bring it to uh, one of the, uh, the lectures uh, when I have looked at uh, your results in there, and then we'll have a talk about uh, that uh, at another time. Now, Let's go back to look at then what Richard Rommel uh, is saying about good strategy and a bad strategy. Now, what he's saying about a good strategy is that this is a plan of actions, that they are uh, focusing, and this is a very important word in, uh, in this connection in there, so they're focusing on one or at least uh, not more than a few of very uh, pivotal objectives so that you can uh, achieve the vision that you have uh, for the company. Uh, this is his definition of a good strategy. A bad strategy, this is where you have a lot of talk, there are uh, many goals in there, and there's not a lot of uh, neither policy nor, uh, nor action. And it very much assumes that what you need is a list of, uh, of goals. So you will find that uh, there will be a lot of uh, nice words in there, but there will be very little to actually take action on. And I'll bet that uh, if you put another logo on, then it could be another company without any problems. So if we look at then the same list of, uh, of definitions that we had before and start with what a good strategy, uh, strategy could be, then uh, we still 
uh, have it that a good strategy is a way to go through the difficulty, the approach to overcome an obstacle, uh, but also that this consists of an action focusing on the energy and resources on very few uh, objectives. And this is very important that it focuses on a few objectives. If you have too many objectives in a strategy, then it'll be difficult for you to, uh, to uh, get them all, to reach all of them in there. And there will be too many people focusing on the small objectives. Then we have the goal, which is this uh, uh, overall um, value and desires. No, no, nothing new in that, and the same with the objective, and the same with the uh, deadlines and the plan. So these are the definitions that we're going to use in the future. And these are also the definitions that you will use when we, uh, for instance, have our uh, Friday and Saturday session on, uh, on the simulation where you're going to run your own hotel. Now, what is Richard Rommel saying? He's saying that you need to have a good strategy, you need to have a structure, you need to have the kernel to uh, make sure that you go in the right direction. It all starts with a diagnosis. You have to define what is actually the challenge. You have to go in and look behind and find out what is the reality of what you want to achieve. Why do you need to have a new strategy? Uh, in what direction are you going? And you have to make sure you focus on, the, on identifying the uh, most important aspects of the situation. There will be loads of things in there uh, that you could uh, look at, but you have to focus on the most important things. The diagnosis is probably the, the most difficult part of making a strategy. So you have to spend enough time on that. The diagnosis, if you do it the right way, will then end up in a guiding policy where you will deal with the very limited number of challenges and obstacles that you have found. Uh, that you have taken all the other uh, obstacles away which are not important or not important enough to be part of your strategy. Uh, and it has to cope with uh, how you overcome the uh, obstacles in the diagnosis. It's not a detailed description of everything in there, but it shows you what way to go. And it identifies in a broad term uh, the uh, way you're going to deal with the, uh, with the strategy. And this then ends up in the coherent actions. And this is where you have to make sure that you can thereby carry out the, uh, the guiding policy. And also, that you make this in a way so it is so clear uh, that uh, people in the organization will be able to, uh, to follow that. Uh, what is important is that uh, the different uh, coherent actions are linked in together so they work in the same direction and that there are not any of your, uh, of your um, issues that are not uh, covered by your, uh, your actions. And of course it has to work together in that way. Let me give you an example on the diagnosis. Uh, what you basically should ask is, what's going on here? Uh, you have to find out what, in the specific situation that you are in, what is going out here. You have to try to figure uh, a, way, a way forward, and you have to find out what is the, the structure of the challenge that you are facing in there. Uh, you should, from all the information that you will get in, be able to come up with a more clear and more simple story of what this is about and thereby make it able to evaluate the, uh, the strategy uh, and also this uh, set of actions that you're going to come up with. When I, back in 98, uh, arrived in uh, Ukraine to take over the uh, responsibility for, for sales for, uh, for Nestle Food, then I also uh, were facing a number of, um, of, uh, of problems in there and, there and therefore I had to make a di diagnosis of what was the, the problem. So the assortment that we had in Nestle was a typical Nestle food uh, assortment, which consisted of uh, Nescafe. There were some cappuccinos in there. Uh, there were Maggi, baby food, uh, confectionery of the after eight, lion, nuts, uh, whatever you, uh, you have. And there was, of course, also uh, Nesquik uh, uh, powder in there. The sales were not uh, very good, uh, and the profitability was, uh, uh, was basically not there which is okay when you have a, a startup, uh, but there was a high potential uh, for, the, uh, uh, for the products. Some of the products were selling well, some of the products were not selling well, and it was difficult to find out uh, the reason why some products were selling well and others were, were not doing that. We had no sales force. Uh, they were not um, 
uh, they we were focusing mainly on the few supermarkets that were uh, in place in Ukraine at that time. So it was a bit of a, uh, a mess. So what we discussed in there on the reason why we were not selling enough was, could it be because we have too high prices? The turnover, or sorry, the uh, income in uh, uh, in Ukraine at that time were pretty low. Uh, so people could maybe not afford the products that we had. That could be one, uh, one area for our diagnosis. Uh, another one could be the lack of a distribution that, uh, that we had. Uh, we were running uh, pretty expensive marketing campaigns without having uh, sufficient uh, distribution. Uh, so that could also be, uh, be an area. But it could also be that maybe we were advertising the wrong, uh, the wrong things, or it could be maybe because we were not uh, promoting the, uh, the right products. So there were a number of questions thrown up, and thereby also a number of different ways to, uh, to address that. Uh, and of course, not surprisingly, the, the different parts of the organization had different solutions to the problem. Uh, but I don't think that we, from the beginning, had defined the problem in the, in the right way. So in the end, what we defined as the, uh, as the diagnosis, as the question to the diagnosis in there, was that we had lack of availability uh, for, the, uh, for our products. We simply were not with the right products where the shoppers or consumers wanted to buy, uh, to buy our products. So that was our diagnosis that covered all the things that I have mentioned before. And we believe that if we could uh, handle that uh, issue in there, then we would be able to, uh, to move ahead. So taking that from the diagnosis to the guiding policy. A guiding policy is the way that you're going to handle the, uh, the situation, whatever you have found out in your, uh, in your diagnosis, and then also thereby finding out what are we not going to do. Because you can do a lot of things, uh, as I just uh, described before. Uh, and it also has to give you the overall approach on how to handle the different, uh, the different ob obstacles that you have defined. Uh, and it also has to find out how can you use the advantages uh, of the company, uh, of the situation that you, that you have. Do you have to create a new one? Do you have to draw on advantages that you already have? Or what are you going to do? And then you have to make sure that you, using the guiding policy, are channeling the, uh, the different actions in the direction that you uh, want to have it, but without defining precisely what has to be done. This is the height way, the guiding policy is the height way uh, that you're going to uh, move towards. Um, the, uh, going back to uh, the situation in, uh, in Nestle in, uh, in Ukraine, uh, what we said was there, how can we use the leverage of, uh, of Nestle, the biggest food company in the, uh, in the world? Well, Nestle had very good marketing, they had very good products, they had money, and they had the, uh, the patience to uh, wait until the results were, were actually in there. And that was what we very much used to move ahead uh, on this one. So we also looked, of course, at the specifics of, uh, of Ukraine, and then had to make sure that we could combine these two uh, things in there. So uh, as I mentioned before, very low income at, the, at that time in, uh, in Ukraine, but also a hunger for, for Western products, which were perceived as having a, a higher quality. So what we in the end said was that this is gonna work, but on a more long-term basis. So what we have to do and have to make sure within our guiding policy is that we can have affordable products uh, coming out where the shoppers are now, as well as in five years. So what we did in there uh, is what I'm going to come back to in our coherent actions. Now. Actions are very important, and you will see a lot of strategies, a lot of uh, papers that uh, is long on words, but very low on, uh, on action. Uh, and as it is said there, without action, then uh, there wouldn't really be any, any world. Um, the action have to be coherent, they have to be linked in together, and they have to use the energy which is in the, uh, the company. And also it has to be for the best of the company, not just the best for your part of the organization. Uh, organizations don't have to be very big before they develop uh, silos. Uh, so therefore, you have to make sure that these actions are committed all the way through the, uh, the organization. So what did we do in, uh, in Ukraine? Well, basically, we started setting up uh, specific uh, availability targets for the, uh, for the single products. There was a difference on where you wanted to find a KitKat 
uh, which was basically more or less everywhere where a consumer came compared to where you wanted to find a 200 gram Nescafe, which could only be bought by the more wealthy part of the, of the population. So instead of just trying to get all the products in everywhere, we went one step back and then created uh, availability targets for the, uh, different, uh, for the different products in there. Um, what we also said was that we have to achieve a certain level of availability before we start running a lot of uh, advertising. We had uh, spent a lot of money on, on advertising and not really received any or uh, achieved any results on, uh, on that. So we went one step back and then linked the use of marketing uh, directly to how well uh, we could achieve the availability in the, in the outlets. And then we said, okay, availability is one thing, but we also have to make sure that we have the right visibility of the, of the products. Uh, and thereby working on getting the products uh, where the consumers would uh, normally like to find them or where they would be able to see the products in the different shops. So we created merchandising standards uh, going from small kiosks up to, uh, to supermarkets uh, and, uh, and pushed our products in, in, uh, in that way and used the natural of the uh, design of the packaging to create a higher degree of, uh, of visibility. And then we cut down the assortment. Uh, we actually cut down the assortment with around 40% because we had a lot of products which we would not be able to sell for quite a long time at, at that market. Uh, they were too expensive. Uh, they were too uh, difficult or different from the, uh, from the local taste. So there was no reason to, uh, to have them. So 40% of the assortment went out, which also meant that we could fo focus more on, on uh, core products uh, in our assortment. And then we set up criteria for launching new products, because it's always fun to launch new products, but very few of new products become a success. So we had to set up criteria for when we wanted to launch new products, and how we wanted to launch new products, and how much turnover a new product should give after a certain amount of, uh, of time. Thereby also again making sure that what we did had a higher degree of, uh, of uh, security for being a success. At that time we were using importers uh, to import all the products in, uh, in Ukraine, um, and they also had basically the responsibility for the distributors. Uh, and the distributors then had a sales force, which were not specifically ours, but were selling some of our products in there. We knew that we, to be able to build these things on a more long-term basis, uh, had to have another approach. We had to start importing ourselves at one, uh, one point. So what we also did was that we split the importers and the distributors and the sales force and said the importers should import, the distributors should distribute, uh, and the sales force uh, should then sell and only our products. So we built a completely new uh, route to market in, uh, in that way, making sure that our, the distributors were our distributors and they were focusing on our products and that the sales force were also focusing on, uh, on our products, but being independent on working together with the distributors so that we could tell them what to do instead of having the distributor telling them what to do. And then, not at least, we linked the whole organization together on bonuses so that um, whatever was achieved with the sales force uh, also gave extra bonuses to the, uh, to the marketing people or to the office people, thereby making sure that everybody worked in the same direction on this. So in that way, we were able to create a set of coherent actions that uh, were able to uh, support our uh, guiding policy so that we could achieve the uh, overall targets that we had set us for the market.